From the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center, HEC-TV, Boeing, and the Danforth Center are proud to present Conversations, a discussion about long-term solutions to world hunger. Good evening, everyone. I think we're about ready to begin. I wanted to welcome everyone this evening. My name is Robin Frankel, and I am chair of the Friends Committee. And the Friends Organization is the group that sponsors the Conversations series. Um, I want to begin by expressing our appreciation to the Boeing Company, which is the underwriter for the past four years for the Conversations program, and we certainly appreciate their support. Um, this evening's program is being taped, so if you have friends that weren't able to make it this evening and you want to tell them about the program, they can see this on HEC TV beginning on Sunday, November 27th at 5 p.m. And if you are a charter customer, it will be on channel 989, which is digital. And for AT&T customers, it will be on channel 99. As you entered the auditorium this evening, I hope that you picked up a card that you can write your questions on. And there will be ushers circulating through the audience during the program collecting these um, cards for your questions. Also, on that same card will be the bios for our speakers this evening. So as you're writing your question, take a look at their, their bios, which are extraordinarily impressive. Um, if there is time at the end of the program, questions will be taken from the floor. And if that happens, please wait for someone to bring you a microphone before you ask your question. Um, I also want to talk about the Friends organization. Many of you here this evening are members of the Friends. And if you are not a member of the Friends organization, we encourage you to become one. Actually, we encourage you to become a member of the Friends, if you can, as quickly as possible, because the end of the year is coming. Um, and um, there will be direct mail pieces going out, but hopefully most of you have, who are members have already renewed. If not, this is your reminder call to please renew your membership. Um, the Danforth Plant Science Center, as you know, is a nonprofit organization, and it is the support from people like you that really do make a difference. Um, this evening happens to be my last program as chair of the Friends Committee, and I want to announce that my successor will be Matt Wolf. And Matt, for the past two years, has been chair of the Conversations program. So I am very pleased to be able to pass the baton on to Matt. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank my predecessors, who were f chairs of the Friends Committee and actually set an unbelievable bar for me to try to measure up to, um, Bob Virgil, um, Jim Knight, and Derek Rapp. And so I want to thank them for setting the bar and making being chair of the Friends Committee such an unbelievable opportunity. I also want to thank the center's development staff because they really made being chair of the Friends effortless. Laura Chauvin, Tom Bander, and Tam McGuire, um, who I've worked with very closely for the last two years. There's a number of other people who are on the Danforth um, Plant Science Center staff who have also um, contributed to making this job seem effortless and, and unbelievably enjoyable. And during my tenure, um, there have been many changes at the Danforth Plant Science Center, including the transition from Roger Beachy to Phil Needleman, and most recently to Jim Carrington. And the bottom line is that it's been absolutely wonderful working with all of them. They are incredible leaders. And of course, I would be remiss if I did not mention that it's been an unbelievable pleasure and honor to work so closely with Dr. Danforth to achieve his vision for feeding the hungry and improving human health, preserving and renewing the environment, and enhancing our region as a world center of plant science. So 
Once again, being a friend of the Danforth Plant Science Center is a most rewarding experience, and I encourage all of you who are friends to please stay involved, and I want to encourage anyone who's not already a friend to become one, and to become one before the end of the year. <laughs> and now it's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed moderator, Professor Jim Davis, and our distinguished panelist, Dr. Kathy Kahn and Dr. Paul Anderson. And before I actually step down, I just want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. Tonight, to focus attention on hunger and malnutrition throughout the world, uh, we have two guests who are particularly well suited to help us understand the complexity of the problems we face. Uh, you have biographies on the little question cards you picked up, uh, so my introductions can be quite brief. Um, Kathy Kahn is a senior program officer for the Agricultural Development Program of the Melinda and Bill Gates Foundation. She has a PhD in plant, in molecular biology and biochemistry, and is clearly a plant biologist. Uh, it's nice to welcome her back to the Danforth Plant Science Center in 2003-2004. She was a visiting scientist here working with the Cassava research team. Welcome. Thanks, it's good to be back. Paul Anderson, on my immediate right, is also uh, a PhD in biochemistry. Uh, he is director of international, uh, he's director of the International Programs Office here at the Plant Science Center. He's been here since 2008, uh, and he came to the position with 25 years of experience working with the development of a variety of crops, corn, soybeans, wheat, uh, all of which uh, are obviously important grains. Uh, their productivity, their virus resistance, their nutrition, uh, all uh, need work. Uh, I'm delighted to have these guests here tonight as we think about hunger and malnutrition to help us understand the scope of the problem. And indeed, that's where I think uh, I want to start the conversation. Uh, how serious is the hunger and malnutrition problem? We have seven billion people on the world now. How many are hungry? The FAO position on this, who probably does the best counting that I'm aware of, states that there's a billion, a billion of those seven billion people are chronically malnourished. That means pretty much throughout the year, they're hungry and not getting the right balance of nutrients. But um, additionally, there's probably another billion people that during some portion of the year are getting insufficient food. So, and I think you can certainly emphasize that there are two billion people who don't have enough food to eat in the world, and that, that's a terrific problem. But if you think about it from the perspective of agriculture, about 75% of the world's poorest people actually grow their own food, their own crops. So while it's a tremendous problem, it's also a tremendous opportunity because so many farming families are living in poverty. And if we can help them um, to access better inputs for, their, for agriculture, then agricultural development is a way to help reduce the hunger and poverty that those farming families face and to help them create new pathways out of poverty. Well, you, you, you get to a question that was surely on my mind, and that is, uh, do we focus directly on hunger, or do we focus directly on poverty, or do we work on both problems simultaneously? The other thing I'm interested in is, uh, with, with regard to what you could think of as the hungry population, I suspect a lot of those are children. Is Absolutely. there any, any data on child malnutrition which would stunt growth, uh, retard development, and so on? 
So there's a couple of different questions that, that you're asking there, Jim. And I think um, you know one of the important ones you asked is what do we focus on? Do we focus on hunger? Do we focus on poverty? And I think where we're coming from at the Gates Foundation is if we can focus on increasing the sustainable productivity of these farming families, if we can help these farming families grow more food, more nutritious food, then they'll be able to feed their families. Um, so that will address the nutrition problem. But we also hope that as people produce more and they're able to sell that and connect to markets, that they'll have more income. So that as well as feeding their families more, they'll be able uh, to earn more money so that kids can go to school, they can buy shoes and clothes and, and medicine. Well, you talked uh, for just uh, a, a few seconds about the Gates Foundation in particular, but we obviously also have someone here from the Danforth Plant Science Center. How do the two organizations, uh, what brings us together beyond so hunger? So crudely, the, um, the Danforth Center helps us spend the Gates money, <laughs> which I think is, is really, is, is fantastic. So one We of get credit for being helpful, <laughs> in other words. Um, <laughs> So well, one of the things that we say in Seattle is that um, we don't do the work. So sitting in Seattle, although we're traveling a lot, we don't actually do the work. The work, you know, to work with farmers and to produce the crops that are more nutritious and hardier, that's done by, by the grantees. So, so the Gates Foundation is a grant-making organization. We work with grantees like the Danforth Center to empower them to do the work that needs to happen in partnership um, with farmers, wherever possible, farming organizations, local researchers, to reach the farming families that we all care about. And we, w uh, the, the Plant Science Center also works overseas with farmers or with experimental crops. Uh, what gets us overseas? Um, let me back up and add something to what Kathy just sure, said. Sure, of course. We're moving along very quickly here. Um, I, I um, wanted to comment that one of the three main thrusts of the Gates Foundation is to help to um, uh, um, support crop improvement, particularly of crops that are um, especially important to those small um, farmers uh, that we were talking about just a moment ago. And the Danforth Center has capabilities in order to carry out that crop improvement work, but we couldn't do that without the support of the Gates Foundation. So it's a critical tie um, that that um, exists here. Let me, let me take your phrase, crop improvement. Crop improvement might be virus resistance. Crop improvement might be making the crop more nutritious. Crop improvement might make it, might make it drop drought resistant. Um, all of the above, one of the above, or something else. What, what are you including in crop improvement? Yeah. Um, all of the above. The way I like to think about it, though, is two big buckets. Um, one of those is improving yields, removing the impediments to getting the best yields possible, regardless of whether it's uh, dealing with um, biotic stresses or, or um, uh, physical stresses like drought and, and water. Um, but where most uh, organizations work, they only consider yield. We put an equal emphasis on, on the quality of the crop, of the quality of the, the material that's produced by the farmer. So in our case, what's important there is the nutritional quality of, of that crop. So we've got about half of our effort, effort focused on improving yields and about half of that additional effort um, focused on um, making sure that those yields are of quality nutrients. And if I could add one more point to that. So I think the increasing the yields and the increasing the quality is important too. But I also think it's important to reduce the risks that farmers face. So, you know, you've mentioned diseases. There are a lot of various diseases that, that can afflict crop plants, including the cassava viruses, mm -hmm. including another project we work on with protecting wheat against rust diseases. And in those situations, farmers can stand to lose a lot of their crop. I mean, they're facing tremendous risks. So even if we can help farmers maintain the yields that they get and have a steady harvest and a steady income, then that's a powerful intervention as well. Well, I want to follow up on the yield. I want to follow up on nutrition, too. But in addition to yield, which is terribly important, I don't know quite how to put this, but I'm interested also in preserving the yield from rodents, from spoilage, mold, uh, from just, um, use the general word, spoilage and waste, mm -hmm. so that what, in fact, is grown can be either used or sold. Uh, is, is that a problem? Once you get yield, 
Do the farmers have sufficient storage facility or access to market, good distribution systems, so they benefit from increased yield? Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, that's absolutely critical, what we call protecting the crop post-harvest. Um, and there's you know, a lot of potential losses there. Um, and that's an area that we're certainly interested in. Um, actually, if I could make a brief plug, there's two days left on a challenge that we have called the Grand Challenges Explorations, where we've put an open <coughs> challenge for $100,000 grants um, for anybody. Everybody here is eligible to apply for one. Even a political so scientist? That's right, even a political scientist. So if you have an idea um, for a way to help protect crops against losses, so both in the field but also after harvest, yes. um, then we're looking for new ideas on, on ways to do that and the, the deadlines in two days time so it's, it's only a two-page application so you, you've got <laughs> now I want to come back to nutrition how how do you decide what your nutritional goals or targets are uh, if you're dealing with cassava or you're dealing with rice you're dealing with maize um, what's the limit uh, or what's uh, where do you start yeah um, uh, yeah, let me address that. Uh, one, uh, just one additional comment on the spoilage, though. Yeah. The estimated losses, and this is worldwide, is about 40% of, the, of what the food that's produced is lost to waste. It's different depending upon where, where you are. In Africa, it's 40%, but it's lost before you ever get a chance to eat it for the most part. Um, in the United States, it's lost because it's thrown away or spoiled because it's overabundant. But nonetheless, it's 40%. I didn't want to go off on a tangent, but I just no, wanted to complete if you could that last. If, if you can reduce the spoilage, that's as good as increasing yield. We're talking then about 80% increase in yield if yeah. you remove that spoilage. Sure. But also market yeah. opportunities for farmers. Because if, every, if all the farmers in Africa are selling their maize at the same point in time, they don't get such a good price for it. But if they can store their maize and sell it at different times during the year, then mm -hmm. that, that's an advantage. Sure, sure. So to the nutritional um, targets, um, we work with uh, food security crops, staple crops that individuals in developing countries eat on a daily basis. They get their primary calories from these crops, eat them the same things for breakfast you know, and dinner um, uh, for large parts of the year. Any food stuff that's consumed in that sort of way um, is going to result in malnutrition because no food stuff has the mixture of nutrients that are important to keep a person healthy. So um, given that, um, then an individual crop like cassava um, will have particular nutrients that it's especially short of. Um, in the case of cassava, it's, it's vitamin A, it's iron and zinc, uh, it's very low in protein, um, and it, different crops will have different um, deficiencies. And so um, what needs to be addressed are the things that are most efficient. But on the top of that, the things that are most that are deficient that are most important. And the way that's generally gauged is by how much vitality of the person or her productivity of a person is lost as a result of that deficiency. That might be through premature death. It might be through um, uh, just being uh, not, not uh, developing to the extent that you would be able to otherwise or just not being able to perform up to a normal capacity. So. Um, in that case, given that, um, vitamin A uh, comes out uh, very high uh, world, worldwide as one of the biggest problems. The vitamin A deficiency is one of the biggest problems in that regard. And the minerals, um, the, the essential minerals, iron and zinc, are, are quite close behind. And take vitamin A a step further. Is that the vitamin that's related to vision? It is the uh, vitamin that's related to vision. It's, its precursor is beta carotene, mm -hmm. which is in carrots. That's why your mother has told you to eat your carrots. And, and uh, so that's what gives the orange color to carrots, and that's the precursor of vitamin A um, retinol um, in the body after it's uh, consumed. And take this a step further. Biotechnology comes up. Do you improve the nutrition through um, genetic modification to uh, improving the crop and will that crop then be acceptable, plantable um, in Tanzania or Kenya or wherever? Yeah. <coughs> um, our, our general rule of thumb, I think most people's general rule of thumb, is that if you can develop or improve the crop by classical plant breeding approaches, that's the way you do it um, because uh, the probability of success is much higher. 
But for many of these traits, there's not the diversity in the plant itself to be able to do effective breeding to reach the targets that you want to reach, in which case there's really no alternative other than to use biotechnology tools to achieve those. And so uh, in many of these cases, biotechnology is absolutely critical. And yes, one can make these improvements um, so that those improvements, and this is one of the things that the technology gives you, is that those improvements are very specific uh, and deal only with your target uh, and therefore safe um, from, all, from all other perspectives. And is the Gates Foundation actively supporting biotechnical approaches to improving crops, whether virus resistant or increased nutrition? Yeah, so we support a, a variety of approaches. Um, so w we take the view that um, Im increasing agricultural productivity and quality is a complex problem, and there's not going to be one simple, single answer to that. Sure. And what we focus <coughs> on is what do farmers need? What do farming families need? How do you find out what the farmers need? So th a lot of different ways. So y you try to spend time talking to farmers, listening to them, talking to farmer organizations. Um, we consult a lot with, with experts in the field, people here at the Danforth Center, um, you know, scientists in Africa and Asia. Um, so we spend a lot of time listening and trying to understand what the issues are. We also spend quite a lot of time collecting data. So we have projects that partner, for example, um, with the World Bank. They go out and do these surveys very regularly that are very detailed health surveys. So partnering with them, we've added questions specific to agriculture. What are people growing? Why are they growing it? The nutritional status? So that we can get data on what the issues are, where, where the key issues are. But I, I just wanted to circle back to your biotech question, Jim, because sure. I, I didn't want to dodge that. So uh, at, at the foundation, we, we don't... Um, we don't take we don't take a, a, a position in favor or opposed to any particular technology. What we look at is what's going to help farmers. And so exactly as Paul said, there are some cases where, for example, drought tolerance or some <coughs> of the some of the nu nutritional work where you're going to be able to solve the problem that farmers are facing much more effectively using biotech than than you are with conventional breeding. Having said that, the biotech work is a pretty small part of our overall portfolio. We, we've added it up, and I think it's about 7% of the agricultural research that we fund involves some kind of work with, with GMOs. Um, it's an important part of the portfolio, um, and it's one part of the solution. It's one tool that we want farmers to have access to, but, but operating always within the guidelines and the regulations of countries and making sure that products are safe and effective. Now, you said a minute ago that w one of the ways you find out is to talk with farmers. What do they need? What do they want? What will they plant? Can you tell us a little bit about the farmers? Uh, sure. They yeah. surely are small farmers. Sure, and is that because that my cue to show you? I, I was told I couldn't bring a PowerPoint presentation, which is quite hard for a, for a scientist, but <laughs> I have a very compelling <laughs> photo of, um, of a farmer that I met this summer in, in Tanzania. And it was on a visit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I have to tell you, uh, it, it, well, it was on a visit with our co-chairs, with, with Bill and Melinda, and we'd met this farmer. Her name's Christina, and she farms um, cassava and some maize and vegetables in just outside Dar es Salaam. And, and, so we, and I knew we were coming with a photographer because we were making a documentary. And so the day before, she'd been wearing a completely traditional outfit. And so then we showed up after we'd done the pre-visit with, with Bill and Melinda, and there she was wearing a... And at first, I just thought, oh, it's a, like a U.S. baseball T-shirt. And I, I didn't quite put it together. But then I mentioned to one of my colleagues that I was coming to St. Louis. And, oh, you have to show them the, <laughs> the St. Louis Cardinals. <laughs> um, and, and it's very true. I mean, this is what people wear in Africa. You know, they're a lot of... And a lot of the the sports t-shirts get, get shipped out there. So, so this is Christina, <laughs> and this is um, actually a, a fairly typical farmer. We, we, we chose her just because she, her field happened to be next door to a malaria home visit that, that the foundation leaders were making. And, and she, she has eight people in her family. Um, she's growing a number of different cassava varieties. There are, um, how, much there how much land would she farm? I think she, she was farming just over a hectare, I think. So it's a fairly small plot. Um, maybe for the benefit acres. of some of our yeah. audience, can you Sorry. translate that into acres? So perhaps two acres. Two and a half. Yeah, two, two and, and a half, half okay. acres. Um, and it might have been less than that. I mean, I, d I didn't measure it. But it's a fairly small plot. She lives near, near it. She has a quite a few different cassava varieties. And, and she goes out and she harvests them every day. Um, and she, she has one variety she likes for porridge, for breakfast in the morning, another variety for stew. But 
and this is the sad thing in that part of Tanzania, the diseases are pretty bad. She had both cassava brown streak and cassava, ma and cassava mosaic disease on her plot. And it was the, the impact on her yields meant that she was not growing enough cassava to feed her family of eight. So she was not producing enough because she was losing some to these diseases. And so instead, she was purchasing cassava on the market to supplement the family's food. So this is the kind of farmer that, that we want to reach. If we can get Christina better cassava varieties so that they're protected against the disease and they have the taste characteristics and the nutritional characteristics that she needs, then, then she'll be able to feed her family better. She'll be able to save that money. She won't have to spend it on the market. And maybe she can even sell some on the market. Um, so I, I did... Should I show you the other pictures? Or <laughs> <laughs> oh, if it's another <laughs> Cardinals Sorry, picture, go right. for it. <laughs> well, so it was just that on the same trip, I, d I just wanted you to see that. So this was the, the, her field, and you can see, I don't know if you can see the cassava at the front is infected with cassava mosaic disease, so it's quite wrinkled. Um, and this was with, with Bill and Melinda Gates, and they were asking her about, or well, like, does it taste? Because she eats the leaves as well. They cook the leaves in porridge. D does it taste different, you know, when it's all mottled like that? And... And she said no, because she cooks it with coconut. Um, <laughs> but, but the other point here was the gentleman on the left, Joseph Nanguru, he actually spent a couple of years here at, at the Danforth Center. And so he did his PhD work. And as part of that, he visited, he visited the center and spent time doing research here. And now he's back full time in Tanzania and actually leading one of our projects. And so I think that's an example of the impact that that the Danforth Center can have in terms of hosting and training these outstanding African scientists who often can go home and really, you know, have, have this kind of impact. So it was, um, yeah, that was. Now these are from Tanzania. That's right, yes. Uh, you work uh, generally in Sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia. How do you pick your geographic targets? How do you decide where you're going to work? Is it a matter of being welcomed? Is it a matter of the particular food problem that exists? So <laughs> it's a combination of, of, of factors. Um, so the underlying philosophy at the Gates Foundation is a belief that all lives have equal value. And, and so just as Paul was addressing about how do you pick the nutritional problem. So we look at a problem and pick um, how many lives are being impacted by this. So how many people can we reach? So you know, how big is the problem? And then also, although we're blessed with, with wonderful resources, we recognize that the resources that we have are only going to provide a very small percent of the overall solution. So we think in agriculture that we can contribute perhaps two to three percent of the overall need um, for agricultural development globally. And, and so that means that you have to work with other partners and that you have to coordinate and cooperate with others. So we tend to pick areas where we think our dollars can make the biggest difference, where we can have the biggest impact um, from the money that we put in and that, that aren't areas that other people are focusing on as, as we, where we feel there is a lack of attention to the problem. And that was the case with agriculture. So in terms of picking areas, um, we, we, we've actually just gone through this, um, what's called at the Foundation of Strategy Refresh process, so looking at where's th where are the investments that we've made, how are they doing, what do we need to focus on. And as part of that process, um, we're, we're beginning to focus more on, on geographic areas and picking countries that have the greatest number of farmers um, who are dependent on agriculture and who could really benefit from from more investments, and also where, like you say, where there's a welcome environment, where we don't force ourselves on anyone, but where, where do people want to work with us? Where is there an interest? Where is the government putting in place policies that could make a massive difference to farming families? And what about the availability of markets or distribution systems, road networks, uh, never mind absence of terrorism and a secure environment? Yeah, so all of those are important, and I think we have to recognize that we can't do that alone. <laughs> You know, so, for example, at the foundation, we, we will not be responsible for building roads. But you're absolutely right. Building roads is critical for connecting to markets. Um, so we have to recognize that we can't do it all mm -hmm. um, and that we have to work with other partners where that's possible. And so I think 
you know, lately we've had a lot of conversations with the government of Ethiopia, and Ethiopia is putting a lot of investments into agricultural extension workers and health extension workers. So they're really training up a, a, a cadre of many thousands of people who will go out and work with farmers and provide them access to new seeds and new tools and new management approaches. So that's an example where the government's already investing. And by going in and partnering with them, we can come in as a neutral party because they recognize you know, that we're not in this to kind of make mm -hmm. money ourselves or to boost trade or anything like that, but we want to help them reach as many farming families as possible. So we can discuss with them and learn from each other and bring the best thinking that we can get our hands on to bear on the problems, and then, but absolutely, we don't go alone. Another question that occurs to me along these lines has to do overall with productivity. I read in, in something I saw from the Gates Foundation that in Sub-Saharan Africa, the cereal yield is about one ton per acre. In this country, the cereal yield is about seven tons per acre. Mm -hmm. So it's tools, it's practices, it's resources. Um, but is it realistic on that two and a half acres that that cardinal span was farming, is it realistic to think that she could get up to seven tons per acre, or should we settle for two or three tons per acre? What are the productivity goals? So, you know, I, I, I guess I approach life as an optimist. Um, you know, and if you look at a glass, you say, well, I could say, well, it's one third full and, and, and it's getting fuller. So in this case, I would say, you know, absolutely, there's a huge productivity gap, but you can also look at that as, as a possibility, right? Like, imagine what's possible. Like, I think that farmer Christina could easily be getting 10 tons at an, uh, you know, a hectare of, for cassava. It depends on the crop. So it, there's a real opportunity there to help farmers boost their yields. We know it can be done. Like we know it's possible. So what we need to do is get farmers the tools so that they can, so that they can deliver the results. I can't resist asking. You're, a, you're an optimist at heart. I'm a skeptic at heart, probably. <laughs> do you have an example that you could point that Cardinals fan to saying, she got up to 10 tons per acre. You can too. Yeah, actually, I've met farmers in Tanzania who are getting 25 tons um, a hectare for, for cassava, because cassava is actually able to yield m much more highly. And, you know, that's a farmer who's, who's actually very, he, he's made friends with the local researchers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he's gotten access, you know, to the best varieties as they come out. And he's, he always peppers them with questions about, you know, what can we do? so that we can improve our yields. And he's producing his cassava in a way that he's using clean cutting so they're free from diseases and he's got the best available varieties coming through. So absolutely it's possible, absolutely. You're the optimist. I am the optimist, but yeah. you know, it's not just for cassava. I mean, one of my favorite projects, it's not one I work on directly, is with rice. And so their scientists um, have developed rice that can effectively hold its breath underwater. So this is rice that can, can survive being submerged in floods for more than 10 days. And so there you actually go out into the fields in India and Bangladesh, and, y and you can see farms where the farmer who was growing a rice, a regular rice, lost lost the crop oh yeah. in floods and then a farmer who's growing a rice that contains this it's the gene called sub 1a and this is through conventional breeding you know survives the floods and and so this variety and what makes me optimistic is that the farmers love it so at the end of this year there'll be a million families in india alone growing improved rice that can survive flooding they should also be no. planting that rice in thailand from what <laughs> i <I've been laughs> <saying. laughs> Yeah, so, so I mean the thing is, w when you can get a product that really works, that has a compelling benefit, mm -hmm. and then if you, there's a lot of ifs, and uh, you know, there's a lot of work to be done to make it available, but if you can make that available to farmers and give them a choice, then farmers like Christina are gonna choose those new varieties that, that help them you know, achieve their own goals for their lives. Now we've, we've mentioned cassava a, a fair bit, and now rice. Are there other crops, maize, wheat? Uh, what, what crops is the Danforth Plant Science Center focused on now? I know cassava is big here. Cassava is about 70% of the work that goes on here. And uh, the lab of uh, Dr. Claude Fouquet has been very um, aggressive in, in uh, helping to advance that crop. But there's also work going on here in disease-resistant maize, um, in ground nuts, um, um, uh, sweet potato. And uh, in addition, uh, we uh, in, in the International Programs Group 
do product development support, not just for the Danforth Center, but for institutions outside the Danforth Center. So we can extend that to um, work that we do on banana um, improvement, on uh, sorghum improvement, cow peas, um, and then also um, sweet potato outside as well as inside. So a real spectrum of the crops that we call um, orphan crops that aren't getting the attention um, from uh, other sources um, because there's not good commercial markets for them, yet they're, they're ripe to have um, technology uh, or just better uh, management approaches brought to them to increase their yields. I have a lot of other questions, but let me turn to some written questions. Kudos to Bill and the Gates Foundation, but my concern is what drastic steps should be taken to ensure that improved crops and other inputs get to farmers in rural areas of developing countries where the subject of the today's discussion um, we're hammering on that. Um, and you certainly understand the issue. It's got to get out to people who will plant and harvest and, yeah. uh, and, and so the question is what steps should be taken to ensure or maybe the Gates Foundation or and its partners are already taking the steps that need to be taken. Yeah, so I mean, this is absolutely a critical question. Like, y you can do the science, but how do you get it to the people who need it? Um, and it's not there's not like one single easy answer, and it varies from crop to crop. So, um, let's take a couple of crops for an example. So, a crop like wheat, um, which is very important for smallholder farmers in Ethiopia. Um, that's a crop where if you get farmers a, a little bit of seed, a handful of seed, that they can try it on their farm um, and see how it works, then they can save the seed. They can save the seed, and if they like it, the next year they can plant more. That's a pretty <coughs> easy, relatively easier crop to work with because um, it's self-seeded, and so it's easy to save the seed. Farmers in the U.S. even save their seed for wheat often. Now that's the kind of that's the good news. The bad news for a crop like wheat is it makes it less attractive for the private sector <laughs> to invest in producing wheat seed because why would they when farmers can just save it? So it's kind of a good news bad news scenario. Um, but then for a crop like maize, that's a crop where farmers are better off purchasing seed from a supplier because you want hybrid maize. So you're better off if you if you if you get hybrid maize that's from two different parents. And so farmers will tend to come out ahead if, if they can purchase a source of hybrid maize. So the good news on that is that, well, then there's an incentive for private seed suppliers to supply, <laughs> to supply maize. And so we're seeing, I think, more success right now initially with, like, with more private sector supplies of, of maize in sub-Saharan Africa. And you take a crop like cassava, that's even more complicated. So there, farmers can absolutely save and replant cassava, but they do it by taking cuttings. So from a single cassava plant, you can maybe produce eight cuttings that you would then go on to replant. And there it's a challenge for the seed system because of these virus problems. If your cassava plant's infected, so a, a farmer like Christina, she's replanting her cassava, she gets it from her neighbors, but she's planting cassava that's infected with viruses. Mm. So then that, that's a problem. So those are kind of three very different challenges for, for seed systems um, and uh, it I, I wouldn't say it's an area that we we have like absolutely clear complete answers to yet because we don't it's complicated different people are going to be involved there's sure. going to be informal seed sector like both for wheat and for cassava where you have farmers individually growing growing the crop for seed and then selling it to their neighbors bartering it um, and extending it that way you know, there will be, there's, there's government seed companies in places like Ethiopia, but we also do want to encourage private enterprise with, with, with small-scale seed producers mm -hmm. who can mm -hmm. deliver seed. So it's something that we're very aware of. The kind of grants that I'm managing um, are much more on the research side because I'm a biologist, but I have colleagues who are very much focused on working with farmer organizations um, and with extension systems. Sure. Yeah. A, f a few minutes ago, we talked a little bit about biotechnology, yeah. GMO, and so on. Unfortunately, there are many people who are misinformed about the realities of biotech, especially safety issues. How do you respond to these misconceptions? And I'd add to that, are there misconceptions overseas in your target country as well as misconceptions in this country? 
Yeah, so there are definitely misconceptions overseas. I mean, I've, you know, uh, yeah, there are definitely misconceptions. I mean, I've met people in Africa who really think that eating biotech can make you sterile or, you know, can cause cancer or something. So there's some way out there misconceptions. But then there's also misconceptions that, that, have, that have a grain of, of truth in them in terms of, like, who owns the technology. So, y y y I mean, the, the thing is, like, it, it depends on the crop. So for a crop like cassava, when you improve that, you know, with genetic modification, it's going to be available to people to share farmer to farmer um, as a public good. So, um, you know, I think the way that we address the biotech is by focusing on what do farmers need. So I'll come back to this. We have a project, um, Water Efficient Maize for Africa, that is a grant to the African Agricultural Technology Foundation, but it partners with Monsanto here in St. Louis to access some of the best technology that's available from Monsanto um, for drought-tolerant maize. And we really expected at the foundation that we would get a hit a lot for that, you know, in the press for, oh my goodness, you're partnering with Monsanto, and it's, you know, the very scary, and, and this, that, and the other. But we've actually been really surprised um, by the reaction in terms of how positive it is. And I think the reason for that is that um, that when farmers talk about what they need and the clear challenge that drought faces, if you can help people understand, look, this is a real problem for farmers. You know, these droughts come in and people lose their crops and, and they starve. And when you look at it through that lens, through what can we do to help people get access to more drought tolerant maize, certainly for the farmers, you know, they want solutions. Mm -hmm. So a farmer like Christina is not going to ask you I mean, we have to make sure that we deliver her something that's safe and that is effective, but she has other problems to worry about than, you know, is it GMO or is it not GMO? She wants something that's safe and effective to feed her family. Sure. I would like oh. to add that sure. probably just from another perspective, the most important way to gain the acceptance of people um, for biotechnology and the comfort with it is to show them the results um, of, of biotechnology efforts. And if you were to see a cassava plant that had been engineered growing in an infected field in Uganda, as we have, we've been fortunate <laughs> enough to have, um, it's just aws it's awesome. It's, it's, um, it, people are just absolutely amazed um, that this can, be, this can be happening. And, and uh, the word spreads fast um, that uh, this technology can deliver that sort of thing. And uh, I think the more that happens, the, the, the more the misinformation is going to go by the wayside. Right. I mean, I, wouldn't want, I don't want to minimize the challenges because it is a lot more complex to deliver a product that's, that's a GMO. Like, it's sure. a lot more complex than, than it would be for a conventional product. So I think we have to choose examples, you know, as Paul says, where it's compelling and, and there's a need. And we're also making investments... Um, for example, with the African Union and the new partnership for Africa's development um, with Michigan State University to help African regulators learn about the technology and make their own decisions. Mm -hmm. um. Here's a question that's a bit of a surprise, but it's an interesting question. We're hearing that portions of the U.S. population believe it is not the role of the United States to feed the world. How do you convince these people of the validity of your work? And I think your work could be your work, Paul, or your work, Kathy. So I, I think it's, it's a good question. Um, and, y you know, it's it, the world is becoming more global. So, y but y you can tell someone, well, there's two billion people that might be going to bed hungry tonight. And that's, I think, often that's not as compelling as understanding the situation of one person. Um, so some of it is just helping people get access to stories about the f about the real people, you know, on the other side of the world who happen to be wearing a baseball T-shirt that they wouldn't be able to tell you it was the St. Louis Cardinals, but but that's an that's someone who who is a real person who just like us, you know, who, who needs help. So I think some of it is just an understanding and appreciating the situation of our fellow humans around the world. Mm -hmm. But I think, okay, so that's a kind of, you know, bleeding heart answer. But you can also take a more pragmatic view. Um, if people are hungry and they're angry and they don't have enough and there's a lot of poverty, you know, they're a lot more likely to cause problems and you know that's w w we look at hotbeds of terrorism and where people are coming from 
um, you know, if they don't have enough to eat, and if if they're mm -hmm. if they're living in situations of tremendous injustice, then you're a lot more likely to have security problems. I, I had wanted to bring that up too. Uh, it's it's, po it's hunger and poverty that are major causes of insurrection around the world. If one is thinking narrow-mindedly about feeding people, that's one thing. But if one is thinking about world peace, that's totally another. And um, I, I think that you do have to think about it in a broader. Um, Scale. The shorter answer, it seems to me, is that's in our interest to help people. Right. It's, that sounds self-interested. Obviously, it is, right. but but it's a broad view of self-interest. Right. And I think if you can help people catch some of the excitement and the sense of possibility and the ability to make a difference, then you know I think that that can encourage more involvement and engagement too. How do you identify a partner? Um, how do you identify a potential partner in Uganda or Kenya or Tanzania? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, w w who we are working with most effectively are uh, the agricultural research organizations that exist in that country. And these ARIs are like the equivalent of RARS in the United States. They're like the USDA in the United States. Um, so they're, they're organizations that are funded by the government and they they are charged now with improvement of those crops by plant breeding and the dissemination of improved crops on an ongoing basis so they're really the perfect partner and in the case where that that partner also has trained or has individuals that have been trained um, in in uh, a variety of different technologies um, they become even better partners so um, uh, so uh, that it's our choice to work with those because they have, they have the tools in place to go all the way from uh, a, a newly uh, improved um, variety all the way out to be able to deliver it to, to the farmers. Um, and they have uh, correct people in place to be able to guide that. Now, does the Gates Foundation also hunt for partners in its Absolutely, Target and we, we particularly hunt for um, African national partners whenever we can because we'd, we'd like to work as much locally as we can because mm -hmm. these scientists that Paul's describing, are they're very close to the problems and to the farmers. Um, sure. And oftentimes they've made real personal sacrifices and commitments to do this work. I mean, I'm thinking of Joseph Nunguru, whose photo I showed you there. He had offers um, in Germany, Japan, and the United States, and South Africa, but he wanted to work like at home in Tanzania, close to farmers and, and to deliver mm -hmm. benefits to those farmers. And so when you find a partner like that, who's very competent and oh committed, yeah. it's, it's like gold. And plus I have to say from a, you know, from a financial point of view, it's a lot cheaper as well. I mean, you can do a lot more um, when, you, you know, when, you work, when you work with local, local partners and they have a lot more understanding often of, of, sure. the, key of the issues involved. But actually, I did want to circle back on, because I think the question is a very good question about how do farmers get these varieties. So what Paul's describing is how these experimental cassava lines that have you know, protection built in against virus diseases and improved nutritional qualities, those are still at the testing stage, they're at the field testing stage. So this is how the partnership is being developed to do the field tests on the ground in Africa. But I think the question is also, well then, once you have improved varieties, how do they get to farmers? And so we have some other projects right now that are, that the cassava's not as good as the cassava that's going to be coming from these field trials. It's kind of a, that farmers need something now. So sort of as an interim measure, we've been working on some projects to get clean cassava planting material, the best that's available out to farmers. And there it tends to be a three-stage process because you can't have all the farmers going to the research station. It just won't be able to provide for everybody. So the research station provides some initial clean planting material. That grows out to what we call a primary multiplier who's in a clean area and is very closely monitored to make sure that the, that the material is clean. So they multiply it at that at that stage, and then it goes out to another multiplier who tends to be farmer organizations or local non-government organizations who then multiply it and then reach out to farmers. Mm -hmm. So you kind of, it, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge at multiple steps to kind of multiply clean material. And um, keeping it all coordinated right. must be a bit of a challenge. Yes, I mean, it's not, it's, 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 it's yeah, I, have, I really respect and admire the, the folks yeah. that do it. <laughs> we have two. Related questions, uh, earlier in the conversation we talked about the amount of crop lost to spoilage. And there are two questions on that. Dr. Khan, can you expand on spoilage 
is the biggest cause of spoilage, moisture, mold, what else? And this one, if 40% of African crop yields are lost to spoilage, what science and investment is being done to specifically address the issue of spoilage? Yeah, so th those are great questions, and I'll preface them by saying I'm, I'm, I'm on the edge of my knowledge here because I'm, I'm not an expert at all in, in the spoilage questions. And I think it's multiple, multiple causes. We know when you visit an African farm, I was in Ethiopia the week before last, and we went, the farmer was growing potatoes, and we went to see um, it w where he was storing these potatoes, and it was just this kind of shed that had this huge pile of potatoes in them. And you know, y it was moist in there. Um, it's a perfect environment for, for for fungi to to take off and you know to infect the crop. There were probably rats that could get in fairly easily. Um, so I mean, I think it's multiple causes. It's it's diseases that hit them. It's it's rodents. So what can you do about that? Well, some in of this and insects and insects absolutely. Yeah. Insects are huge. So you know. The so there are different things that you can do. So we, we, have, we have one project actually that involves um, just producing these plastic bags that can be sealed that farmers can put their product in to, to keep the insects out. Like to keep the bags? Out. Yeah, they're sort of vacuum thick plastic okay. bags. And so they've been quite effective with, I think, with cow peas in West Africa. And so now we're looking to see, can that be expanded? These are um, a little bit bigger than a Ziploc bag. They're right. about 100 pounds. Oh, okay. And, and yeah, and yeah. That's more thick, than I put in my refrigerator. Right. Yeah. So th there's that that sort of solution. I think we're also hoping that through this grand challenge exploration, that we get new ideas coming in. Some of the solutions are going to be engineering. So are there ways that you can build cheaper structures? You know, that that are with local materials. I mean, these solutions exist um, often, but it's how can you get them? What we say to scale. How can you get them to reach many farmers in a way that's effective? Um, and I don't think it's going to be one single answer, but I think there'll be multiple solutions. So if you've got pr crops that have inbuilt protection against fungal diseases, for example, some of the things that they're working on here at the Danforth Center, then those crops are less likely to spoil. Mm -hmm. um, if you've got decent structures to keep your, your harvest in, then it's more likely to, to be with you for longer. It's interesting, the bags that we were just talking about with respect to their trial use and in cowpeas, um, and they are really only tri uh, trial uses, I think, to this. They might be being exploited broader than that. But um, uh, the people um, who use them uh, actually saved so much more of their crop um, that it made it worth it to them to buy them. And so yeah. it became sustainable um, at that point. Um, there was enough preserved food from the use of those bags that they had more to sell and and they actually had um, uh, uh, earned way more than enough money to buy new bags. That seems to me to be an easier solution than in working to increase the yield. Uh, just save you know, save the crop. I agree. Well, it, it <laughs> but I think I think it's multiple. I think it's multiple okay. issues that sure. often sure people are, are, are spoiling. But I, I think, like, you know, it, this you, s you mentioned at the beginning about the complexity of the issue. So th there are multiple reasons why people are losing crops, and we need to tackle as many of them as we can. So that includes post-harvest, but it includes, y you know, protecting crops in the field as well. Now, this, this last question, which I'm told we have time for one more, is a question that requires some imagination, but it's an interesting question. <laughs> if you could click your heels... I had trouble with that, but I, but I think that's <laughs> right. Dorothy and so on. What hot spot would you go to, and how would your work, your funding, change lives, and which crop or practice? So we're only where would, you, where would you go, or what would you do? So what, just to transport myself there and... Yeah, and what hot spot something? would you go to, and how would your work or funding change lives, and with what crop or practice? Yeah, so, I mean, for me, w one of the things I would say is that, like, I myself am not directly doing the work. So I'm helping to identify the project. So even if I was transported to Uganda or to Tanzania right now, just my landing there is not going to make a difference in the way that transporting, <laughs> you know, one of the scientists that you're training here from Tanzania or Uganda. So I would, I guess, if I'm allowed to, like, 
not answer the question directly, I would choose to transport someone else there. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> much as I love the place, but it's kind of like, where can you make the biggest difference? So what yeah. I would do is pick one of these fantastic scientists that you're training here in St. Louis and, and put that person, let's say in Tanzania, you know, where the, the virus disease problems are just terrible with cassava and there's really an opportunity to increase the yields that those farmers are, uh, are getting mm -hmm. right now. I'll offer you an opportunity to be transported oh, too. I like that answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think we're close to our hour, but there are three things that we haven't talked about that I think we'll need to have our guests back at some time. Uh, I would have asked more questions about climate change and the effect of that on yields and uh, productivity. I would have asked about more about energy and the environment. And then I would ask how pro productivity will have to increase to cope with rising population. We're 7 billion now, by 2050 we may be at 9 billion, maybe 10 billion. Uh, so we can't, we can't just get a little better and we obviously can't stand still. Uh, we have a, an agricultural development problem in perpetuity, I should think, or at least uh, for, the for, the, for the longer than foreseeable future. Yeah. Well, we c I can't let us end on that note of, of, of skepticism. I know. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> sorry, you know, I'm giving like the optimist <laughs> an opportunity. Right. <laughs> right. So, I mean, I think, you know, what's so exciting now about science is, you know, the advances that have been made in the last 20 years are opening up new possibilities. So, I mean, I do believe that we can develop crops that are much hardier against climate change, that are much more protected against diseases, um, that have better nutritional characteristics, and that we can deliver those to farmers. Um, and when you get those in the hands of farmers, which, as we've discussed, is a big challenge, then those farmers are part of the solution. They're not the problem, but they're part of the solution to world hunger. And if we can give them the tools that they need, mm -hmm. then farmers like Christina can, can grow more to feed their family and can sell the extra and can create their own pathways out of poverty. So, I'm hopeful. <laughs> Good. I think we should end on a hopeful <laughs> note. <laughs> and now I want to call on Jim Car Carrington, the president of the Plant Science Center, to close with a few words. All right. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, thinking about what I would just wrap this up with, uh, I'm, uh, this is going to sound like a plug for what we're doing at the Danforth Center. And I, I'm not even going to try to <laughs> fool you, it, it, it is. <laughs> but what you heard about today was what we want to get science to and where we want to see science make a difference. You saw the end point in this continuum that we talk about a lot of what we do at the Danforth Center, which is to explore basic mechanisms of how plants work, and that includes those viruses and those fungi and molds that you heard about. And then we work on ways to take that knowledge that we learn here and that other people learn and how to make those discoveries useful in some way. And then we take it to the point that you heard about out into the field where people can actually use the information and have a better life. So you, you heard this, yeah, that was absolutely brilliant. And there's, and let me go back to the beginning of this, and because a lot of people don't understand why we spend so much time on the basic science here. It, you heard about virus-resistant plants. That's the end point of the 20 years Kathy talked about that started in laboratories like David Balcom, where we learned and made discoveries about how to make virus-resistant plants. That was 15, 20 years ago, and we're now seeing that work go through this continuum. Why do we need to keep doing this type of basic work? It's because the problems that we need to address next, or in 10 years, that moving target of problems, some of which we can anticipate, but a lot we can't anticipate. So we need to keep our eyes on this whole set of problems not just at the basic discovery end, but, and not just at the implementation end, but view science as contributing all along the pathway. So I want to thank uh, Kathy for coming. I hear it's 
Uh, rainy and damp in the Northwest this time of year. Thanks for coming. Uh, at least we got you a little bit of sunshine. Uh, Paul, you're a great colleague. Thank you. And Jim Davis, as usual, great job. Thank you very much. I want to thank. Uh, I want to thank Matt Wolf for organizing the conversation series this year and welcome him on as uh, chairman of the Friends Committee. It will be great working with you, Matt. And last, certainly not least, I want to thank Robin for your great service to the Danforth Center, specifically to the Friends Committee. Uh, you made a lot happen, and we all appreciate your work. Th join me in thanking Robin. And, and finally, thank you all for coming, and we'll see you in a few months at the next conversations.